guy who is the chief chemist of a I'm sitting right next to me. Multi billion yeah. dollar company has to sit next to me in the flight. Right. Exactly when I have come out of hospital because of the And you taking the medicine in front of him like yes. too much. Yeah. So this is guest for today is Sachin Gaur. Sachin is a taker, researcher and a scientist. He's also one of the smartest people I've had the pleasure of knowing. Sachin has built five companies, invested in about 20 and still is on the path to solving problems for the world. Sachin, welcome to the show. Thank you. What were the beginnings like? Let's start right from the top. Well, I think like most Indians, the beginnings are always humble. Okay. <laughs> Born in a lower middle class family, mm -hmm. struggling to make the ends meet uh, okay. from a family perspective. Mm -hmm. So I <clears throat> started taking tuitions uh, very, from the very young age, like I think oh, I was okay. teaching sin like since I was 14. Okay. So that would help me to fund my education. Okay. Okay. So yeah, so from there. What, it, what, would you what did you teach? Yeah, so I was always teaching one standard below that I was in. So okay. if I was in ninth, I would teach eight standards. Okay. Enough recency then. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, yeah, so I think that continued for me until college when I did my B.Tech. Mm. So these were like eight years, which was very regimental because I would wake up at 4 a.m. and, you know, uh, go to Delhi mm. from Ghazibad, mm -hmm. 6.30, start, you know, and by the time I'm back, it's already three, oh. then go and take tuitions yeah, yeah, yeah. and go and sleep. So there was never time for me to study. So my opportunity was that if I have, if I can be very present in the class, mm -hmm. I can grasp as, as much as I can. Mm -hmm. But then when I teach people, you know, you you basically learn on your own, right? Correct, correct, so correct. Yeah, so correct. those were my uh, beginning years. So, uh -huh. but if I go to my real real beginning, I think I was always like a dreamer. Okay. I remember when I was speaking to my classmates in school. Once I told them, you know, we was taught condensation and. I <laughs> went to my home because my mother comes from a village and I asked her, you know, I have this glass which has chilled water. Why is the water coming outside, outside. from the glass? Yeah, yeah. The glass is not leaking. Yeah. So my mother could not solve that puzzle for me. But I was smiling, you know, because I knew that this is condensation. And yeah. when you used to go for uh, summer holidays in the village, I would tell my maternal uncle that I can build a reverse fridge. And instead of getting water from the ground, we can build it. Oh. We can get water from the atmosphere. Wow. And maybe this was, you know, 35, 34 years ago or today these kind of machines do exist. They do. Yeah, yeah, yes. yes. Where you can actually use condensation. And you so, came up with the idea originally. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody has any original idea. Okay. But it's just that, you know, sometimes you, you are dreaming about things, you encounter them. Yeah. But then you also need conviction to build them. So Correct. I think if I was, uh, let's say, in a more resourceful setting, mm -hmm. I would have told people about these kind of, you know, bizarre ideas. Mm -hmm. Then probably if we were having access to a garage, you know, maybe we would have ended up building it. And, you know, I think that would have been a very different. I think when you have very humble beginnings, sometimes you're not very resourceful. Exactly. exactly. But this is how my classmates from school remember me, that I was always telling them some bizarre ideas that uh, they remember me. And what was what came after school? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I went to college, uh, did my computer science. Uh, Why did you choose computer science? Actually, it's an interesting question because uh, I ended up learning about computers much early. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in eighth grade, I had a certificate uh, from a small time institute about programming. So I got so bored of programming because uh, that I thought, you know, for the next four years, I will probably study biology. <laughs> so I didn't study uh, computer in my, okay. But when I was in school, like already, you know, KG, first class, we were using logo. Yeah, 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 logo draw. Yes. Drawing. So I think I had access to computers, you know, all my eight grades uh, of education in school. Mm -hmm. And uh, I became so good at it that I was the, you know, man Friday for anyone who had computer, go and fix their computer, install OS. Yeah, yeah. You know, back in those days, Nehru Place was a thing and, you know, mm -hmm. 
who, it's like you are scrambling everything yeah, from there. Yeah, right? So I was, diving, yeah. yes, I was that guy. Okay. So maybe I didn't have further guidance, and maybe I again it comes to excess, right? So I didn't have. So you had a natural propensity to be solving problems, right? Right. You had that in you. Yes. And uh, getting to work on a computer, which is a tool which which gives you infinite leverage. Right. What was that like? Yeah, I mean, it's a, again, it's a, I, I think maybe at two levels. So computer is like a tool, right? Right. But you still have to bring your imagination. Exactly. Yeah. But right. I'm saying like, you know, that was already there. Yeah. So it's like, you know, you were trying to dig a hole with a spoon and suddenly you discover that there's something called a spade. So I remember, you know, uh, when I moved away from computers the four years, so yeah. when I came back to college or let's say around that time, it was it was like for me that I have to now learn programming because whatever I was learning back in those days like DBase and everybody is about yeah. Turbo C, yeah. Yeah. you know. So the first idea was that you know uh, there was this card game that people used to play that you have to guess a card, mm -hmm. and after three rounds of shuffling cards, they will you can tell exactly which card that you thought yeah, about. Yeah, 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 so yeah. this was the game I built on uh, using C programming. Okay. Because I in my head I was able to say that okay you know like. You could Tri come up with the logic. Yeah, so it's like a trinary search oh. algorithm, right? Mm. But I would just ask people, okay, these are three rows of number, think about it and just uh, keep telling me the row and I will tell you, the yeah. program will tell you the... Okay. So I was able to take inspiration from these practical aspects. Right. So I think I was always more uh, interested in these kind of insights or inspiration. Mm -hmm. So I would say, as a person, I am very curious and observant, right? right. right. But whether to build that as a tool or technology, I think that those things keep changing, right? So every every time, four or five years, you see totally new things that you can use to build them, right? right, right. How old was college like? College was a lot of hustle, okay. uh, you know. So I, as I said, I was like an average guy uh, because I would not be having a lot of time uh, to study. But uh, <clears throat> I probably got most number of placements mm -hmm. because <laughs> I was practically good. Yeah at doing things right. so and I think that year like Adobe had uh, placed uh, first time they had come to our college to Jamia okay. for placement so I was one of those selected for Adobe for TCS and mm. for there was one more company back in those days called Sparrow Systems, Sparrow Systems okay. and I had also got into Indian Army so I thought at last stage maybe if I go to Army right. you know it was probably a restrictive uh, thing to my career and right. computer science is very horizontal. Correct. So maybe I, if I pick computers, you know, I can build, you know, more things. Well, what made you choose a product company in this, uh, in among the offers that you got? I think back in those days, so far, large extent, it's money, like they were the highest paying. That's you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like once you got in there, like, you know, what were the new things that you encountered? I think the early years of my life while i had computer i probably never had this internet thing you know we what, 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 what's the time uh, that we're talking about what year is this yeah i think Midnight. so when i went to uh, you know school it was you know i graduated uh, or completed my 12th in 2001 mm -hmm. Maybe rich people had internet then, but I didn't have access to internet yeah. because, uh, you know. You are still dial-up days. Yes. Yeah. And when I was in college 2001 to 2005, uh, I think many times we would end up to some kind of cyber cafe. Right. You know, if we had to do something. Yes. Of course, we could also get some internet in college, but mm -hmm. college resources was always at a distance, you know. They would lock things yeah. up yeah. rather than give it to us. Correct. You know? Correct. Correct. So, like with, okay, so now you have internet too. How did life change after that? Yeah, so I think the most fascinating thing in Adobe, I mean, everything that was for us was like new. I mean, I could not ima imagine that that uh, scientists coming from Xerox Park who built uh, Adobe, hmm. that you could be a scientist and you could yeah. actually rethink, you know, yeah. how world works. Yeah. And uh, Chuck Geshke and John Warner who built Adobe, they, they built something fundamental. Mm -hmm. Like they built PostScript, which was used by printers back right, in those right, uh, right. early 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, and they made $200 million every year just by licensing PostScript to printer companies. Nice. Then they came up with PDF. So I ended up working in the PDF team. And it was, in those days, internet did not have a way to show videos. So Adobe had a company, Flash Media Server, and mm -hmm. four kids. 
they built a company called as youtube they sold it in one year for 3 billion dollars so that was very inspiring for me mm-hmm. that uh, somebody can take something mm-hmm. you know and build a 3 billion dollar company in a year mm-hmm. and the first month bill that they, they paid for internet was 17 million dollars wow so that was very like i mean for me this was like early days for internet when it was starting to explode and i think video left a big impression in me but i think being in adobe you started to understand fundamentals what is dolby what mm-hmm. is raster what is vector yeah. you know so a lot of these kind of uh, scientific aspects which when they move to technology space you know you still are able to distinguish you know that what does this mean what does that mean so as a layman you don't understand that but you just hear the word right right, right. so i think adobe was enriching in that way and i think very early in my job i got very lucky that we got a lot of patents oh, how many so i think we filed for around 10 patents in 3 months and you in know in 3 months yeah and uh, yeah so i think also thanks to adobe i had high speed internet and i started to read about uh, things and you know that convinced me to leave my job because i was convinced that uh, most indians are not going to use internet on computers they want to use it inter- from directly to phones phones and yeah. phones were back in those days made in helsinki in finland yeah. so i wanted to go and study there and that's how i ended up you know leaving adobe and packing my bags for finland okay right. and and what did you do at finland but like did you really get into phones then yeah i mean i thought i am going to study mobile security and cryptography that was my topic mm-hmm. so uh, and i was getting again you know why thinking, security and cryptography Yeah, so again, I'm saying so. My keyword was mobile, and going to Finland was that where Nokia was. Right. But uh, I was getting a scholarship, and okay. back in those days, uh, you know, getting free education, studying abroad, uh, I think was not coming cheap. Of course. And even though <clears throat> I had a good job in Adobe, I took a loan uh, to buy a house, mm-hmm. and uh, I had liabilities. Right. So my decisions were motivated yeah. by. you know that if i get go on this scholarship then you know my uh, family doesn't have to yeah. uh, worry too much because my scholarship was more than my salary in adobe wow so <laughs> i had a king size life in uh, finland okay you know I, we did lot of fun stuff so after and during my masters also i got to know lot of interesting people maybe that's a story for another day but i got to work in cern in geneva wow. saw the large and on collider starting what was that like yeah that was impressive because we had uh, people from 120 countries cern would have a lecture series mm-hmm. where i met one of the person that uh, i think i found one of the smartest person mm-hmm. that i have ever met mm-hmm. so his name is louis von ang mm-hmm. and louis you know when he was a student he created captcha okay the wow. whole world feels that yeah yeah you know and then he to solve that problem that he created the whole world is filling those uh, rubbish images yeah. he built another company called as recaptcha sold That's it to right. google mm-hmm. he built an imaging image search based game what is called esp he sold it to google mm-hmm. now he has built duolingo which is another billion dollar company wow so he he has a philosophy that human is the smartest computer on the internet and he has yes. always been using humans mm-hmm. in a crowdsourced way to solve problem So there are certain people in my life I I I borrow a lot of influence from them and I think Louis is one of those person I ended up meeting in CERN you know after watching his uh, Google Tech Talk uh, he ended up in CERN and I think CERN was good in that way that okay you are having uh, lunch and you can say okay these four guys have won the nobel prizes they are sitting there sitting there sitting there yeah. so I think in science uh, the, the the top prize is nobel prize so right. If you are surrounded uh, with a very high density of Nobel Prize winners, then it's oh, very yeah. inspiring, right? It's just like smart by association. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So, so I mean, like you, you acquired a lot of knowledge over there. Yeah. What, What was, was the, the first, first problem that you set out to solve, with with, armed with, with the knowledge that you had? I think at first place when I left my Adobe job was that I was very convinced that uh, people who are going to use mobile phones in India, yeah. right? So they are not coming with an Excel that somebody is using US. Right. Correct. So let's say if I would say the big tech today, mm. back in those days they had the arrogance that the world needs an email to yeah. access internet. Yeah. So when you have a world view, how many people can have email and can access internet? So you make a circle. It's a small circle, yeah. right? Somebody has a different point of view, and they say you don't need an email. You need a phone number. You end up creating WhatsApp. Correct. Right. 
and mm. then you make a bigger circle, right? Uh, 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 so, uh, so you can create twenty billion dollars worth of value by rethinking what yeah. does world need to access internet, okay. right? Yeah, yeah. So my grudge against these big companies was uh, that our population should not be deprived, mm. you know, because internet creates opportunity, okay. right? Yeah. So I was coming from a background where a lot of people <coughs> were number literate but not literate as such. So their participation on internet was limited because they cannot read and write, yeah. right? So for me, I was thinking that we have to design new kind of technology where participation doesn't require you to have an email. Yeah. I mean, my mother till date doesn't have a phone, right? Yeah. So her participation in a internet economy, does it require phone number? The answer is yes. So is she excluded? The answer is yes, yes. right? So if you want to make a bigger orbit of inclusion, so you move from email to phone, then you can move to voice. So my mother can actually call me today using an Alexa speaker yeah. because that Alexa speaker is configured by me to have my Skype. So my parents can drop in nice. you know, yeah. and speak to me. Yeah. So I think we, as we understand the world better, right? Mm -hmm. we can be more inclusive. I think Correct. when you build technology in you Silicon Valley, yeah. you build it for people like yourself. But I think this was my starting point. Why I left my job at first place, mm -hmm. and my master thesis was uh, about building, you know, a, a what do you say, a literacy neutral contact book. Because I believe that the number of people you have in your contact book mm -hmm. is is the number of opportunities you get in your life. So when I came back after, so I, I was doing my doctoral studies and. All my professors were saying light is coming from the east. So I thought what I'm doing in the west, I came back. And then somebody found me, uh, you know, because of my ideas. So they said, maybe we'll make a documentary on these ideas. So they asked me to make an app okay. in real life, but they wanted to film it, the okay. process. Okay. And I did a lot of survey on the ground. And I found that if you are an average person in village, your phone has maximum five contacts. And these are speed dial numbers. Ek dabao, pete ko milega, do dabao, usko milega. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, how can you imagine that woman has opportunities in life because all she knows is five, five people, people. Yeah. right? Mm -hmm. If you're the village pradhan, yeah. and she would have 50 contacts, right? Yeah. And then, I, at back in those days, my phone book was 500 people. So, mm -hmm. I see saw clearly mm -hmm. that it's not that I'm genius. No. It's just that I have 500 contacts, so I have more opportunities than that lady Fatima, who is the village leader. Mm. She's probably 10 times smarter than me, yeah. but she's in a context where access is an issue. Correct. And that lady who is in that village may be even more smarter, mm. but she has five contacts. Mm. And, you know, when I was doing my master thesis, I just wanted to build a contact book where with three clicks, you can access anyone and you don't have to, you know, even know their name. maybe. So these were kind of my initial ideas. Okay. So I ended up building a company which we were calling as Mobile Harvest, mm -hmm. which was like a early version of WhatsApp for India. Mm -hmm. So it was a voice-based social network. What year is this again? 2013. 2013. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, I ended up working in the agriculture space, in the healthcare space, and I realized that you know I was working without a business model. How so is agriculture, agriculture coming? Because most people in India are doing agri in the lower pyramid, right? And right. they have problems related to their uh, farming, right? And they want knowledge, yeah. right? And how do they access knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. So there, you know, if they know, the only thing they know, know is voice, you know. Right, right. I remember we, we came up with this idea that uh, our app mm -hmm. uh, interface was a fake dialer, okay? okay? So let's say if I keep it in front of my mother, and if we know that she knows the green button is to pick the phone. Yeah. So we will configure the app mm -hmm. that it will give a fake call. So it will trick my mother to pick it up. Okay. Right. Okay. And yeah. then we will tell her right. everything we wanted to tell her on the IVR. Mm -hmm. ki you can press one and then you yeah, can get an yeah, email yeah, from yeah. Sachin. Yeah. You know, so we thought we can build a layer mm -hmm. of user interface yeah. on the existing phones, right, which would not require any training. Right. right. Because right. many many times you must have seen you build technology, yeah. then you have to actually educate a lot of people in adopting that technology. Correct. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's also a mindset which technology people bring yeah. that, uh, you know, which requires people to learn. It should be the other way around. Right. Yeah. It should be intuitive. Right. That, yeah. And I think that's the reason why some of these companies are very successful like Apple because they try to yeah. minimize that, uh, you know. Barriers. Yes. Okay. All right. So what, what did you move on to after that? 
Yeah, so I think 2010 I came back to India and you know I was in 2020 going back to Norway. Mm -hmm. But in the last 10 years, you know, I ended up building a couple of companies. So some failed, some continued. What were they into? So various kind of companies that we built. So so our first company, when you say we, it was you and my co-founders. Okay. Right? What so, are what are their expertise? Uh, so in? so I think you know like we. When we started the first company, we still exist today. So it's a consulting company. Okay. So it morphed into a consulting company, but we started, uh, we wanted to build social media kind of thing. Okay. And uh, it was my classmate from BTEC. Mm -hmm. So he ended up uh, going to IIM Calcutta. Okay. And then he ended up working with Nokia. Okay. Okay. And uh, when I was in Finland, he came, uh, okay. uh, you know, yeah. uh, in Nokia. Yeah. And then he was working for some trading company in Africa. So he le left his job. He came back, I came back, leaving my PhD, mm. you know, so that's how uh, we ended up starting that company. But we, we were running that company for like bread and butter, mm -hmm. but we were always doing spin-offs. So this right. mobile harvest was a spin-off yeah. that we did, which yeah. didn't work out. So consulting to pay the bills, services to pay yeah. the bills, but like build yeah. products. Yes. Yeah. And then uh, this another company that we were building with another of the Adobe uh, colleague, uh, he, this was called Family Cart. So we were doing grocery much before Groffers okay. and there also we ended up burning a lot of money, uh, mm -hmm. you yeah, know, we so could not trade investment, space. yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, so there are a couple of failures, uh, you know, in these, uh, then uh, I also realized around this time that I can also help others, yeah, you know, right, right. because of I am learning yeah. and maybe. So I ended up investing in a company which is called Tagbin mm -hmm. and they're quite successful in Gurgaon. So these were kids from IIT Roorkee okay. and they wanted to just work with us because they wanted to do entrepreneurship. So they thought maybe they do internship with us and you know, yeah. so we ended up having them in our office, okay. paying their bills for an hour, year or so. So we ended up throwing them, you know, that when they were becoming a liability, but yeah. you know, uh, they ended up doing well. Mm -hmm. And I ended up investing uh, from ex employees of Tagbin. Mm -hmm. I think I've invested in two more companies. Nice. So in total, I, that's how I ended up uh, investing in 20 companies, yeah. Okay, so how, how do you go about choosing what company to invest in? Like, is there, is there are there some fundamentals that make sense to you right from the back, uh, right yeah, from I the think start? I was always a thesis driven person. And I think when you're thesis driven, you know, it's not that it will work always, mm -hmm. but probably you have a lot of uh, thought process behind it, okay. right? So yeah. when I was doing mobile harvest, it was, you know, right from my Adobe days guiding me that, mm -hmm. you know, we need a better user interface, which yeah. is more inclusive. Yeah. I didn't end up doing, but I think the world moved from email, internet to phone yes. number, internet to voice internet, right? Right. right? So I think these are invariants, right? So whether you are successful or not, they will happen, okay. right? Mm -hmm. I remember in mobile harvest days, people wanted us to build Symbian yeah. apps. Uh, and I always said, okay, no, I will only build for Android because Android will become big. I don't have to prove to you yeah, that yeah. in 2024 that so Android is big, right? Because I think we had this insight, you know, yeah. and in the same way, so... You could you see know, into the future. Yeah, so, yeah. so like 2017, my car was stolen. And I had a bad experience with police. Uh, so we ended up building a deep learning based company, which, uh, you know, monitors the traffic in Delhi today. Uh, it's called Samaj, Samaj.ai. Okay. And we process, let's so say... So mishaps I'm, happen to you and products come out of it. Yeah. So, <laughs> and similarly, I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Okay. So, right. so in, in that also become a quest for me, you know, I ended up learning a lot about my own body, right? Okay. And ended up giving courses to top endocrinologists and, uh, you know, that how, you know, AI is, for example, helpful okay. in learning a lot about your own body. Yeah. So I ended up meeting, uh, you know, uh, very relevant people in that space. Okay. I remember I was once taking a flight from uh, Hyderabad to Delhi mm -hmm. and I was taking a medicine back in those days, it was called Sitagliptin. Okay. So the guy who was sitting next to me was an American okay. and he was usually in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So he was a chief chemist of a company called as Musk okay. and he was the inventor of that molecule that I was eating. So wow. he ended up drawing that molecule in my notebook. Mm -hmm. And he told me a few things in that uh, uh, interaction. You know, I couldn't have that, afforded that interaction, you know, otherwise, because the pharma companies are very secretive, yeah. right? And I ended up going to an extent that I ended up reversed my condition. So oh, wow. coming out of a hospital with a condition where my HbA1c was 13, mm -hmm. 
to going to 5.4 you know yes. so i think for me it was like uh, sometimes you know if you think too much about something hmm. so things start to magically happen so i do believe that a guy who is the chief chemist of a Sitting right next to me, multi-billion yeah. dollar company has to sit next to me in the flight. Right. Exactly when I have come out of hospital because of the and problem. you taking the medicine in front of him makes this yes. too much. Yeah. So this is yeah. you know I I I find this very magical. It has right. happened so Comments. many times yeah. with me in life uh -huh. that the you know the answers keep coming. You know, yeah. so I think if I can stay with the question and you can stay with the question yeah. only when it matters to you. Correct. Right. So most That's of course, my yeah. uh, time spent uh, right now mm -hmm. is things that matter to me. Right. Right. Yeah. So maybe it could be a personal problem, mm -hmm. or it could be an insight. Yeah. So that's how I've been operating for last. Uh, let's say if I graduated in 2005, now it's 19 years. Right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You were talking about so much. I'm sorry, I cut you off right there. So you, the when your car got stolen, yeah. the platform that you developed as a result of that, what was that about? So, you know, so some of these uh, people from Tagwin, they had left their job mm -hmm. and uh, they joined in my office okay. and they had aspirations mm -hmm. and I had a bothering problem. <laughs> so we said, okay, let's, you know, this AI thing is, uh, you know, new thing in the town. Right. I was reading in a flight magazine that a professor in Finland has built a course for their country. It's called Elements of AI. Okay. And he managed to get uh, president of Finland to do that course nice. uh, as the first person. And they ended up by the end of the year, 4% of the country did the course. Okay. So it was an inspiring story for me. And I came to my office and I said, you know, all of us have to learn it. Right. If a professor in Finland can achieve, you know. Yeah. So we had these free minds. Mm -hmm. We had a problem statement. So we said, okay, let's work on computer vision. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we did, we built an office attendance system. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. and we thought, okay, nobody will buy it because people are used to this biometric system, right. which is seven thousand rupees for this kind of system. Yeah. We have to sell them a desktop uh, kind of a More compute, expensive. right? Yeah. But I, I think during COVID, already a lot of people asked us to do face-based attendance, but we had already moved on. So we always believed that whatever we have to build, we have to try it. Right. You know, so we, if we can be our own customer, that's perfect. Right. right? So we started with face attendance system. We used to do a conference in Delhi. Mm -hmm. So this conference, anybody who had come to the conference, they got their pictures almost in real time as they were clicked. Yeah. Wow. So this was, I mean, just yeah. last December, I was organizing this conference again. And this lady is the owner of a very large hospital in Delhi and CR. So she was remembering that how pioneer we were in our approach. So we were always, you know, uh, we were always trying to build things that we would need because we thought, okay, we are clicking thousands of pictures. Yeah. And even if we give the dump to people, they're wasting so much time because they're only interested in their own pictures. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So we thought, okay, we'll cluster them by faces. We already know the speakers. Right. So the system could organize an email and send it to people. Yeah. You know, all our guys had to do was put an SD card, which was Wi-Fi connected. Mm -hmm. So as they click the picture, it comes to the system. You know, we index it and we send it to the uh, the user. How cool is that? But we this is what we did in 2018, and we realized that nobody is going to pay us for this in India. So this is another dead uh, product type. Why is that? I, I can think of. I think we probably are in the wrong market. You know, when it comes to I guess you know, people willing to pay. And I, I think you're too early. <laughs> all, all the time, you're like at least four or five years before like the problem is identified by a large group. Yeah, but I think for us also we were doing doing things because we were enjoying them. It was yeah, not yeah, really know, with a mindset that we have to build like a billion dollar company. For sure, yeah. We were learning, so we were building these systems yeah. because we wanted to build a full cycle, right? Yeah. So not just build it, but use it mm. and see how people appreciate it. Yeah. So these were use cases for us. Okay. And then the overarching problem for us was traffic. Mm. And it took us two years to build this model that could monitor the traffic because in India, there's a huge diversity of number plates. In like best, you have standardized. In the Indian market, you know, a uh, lot many times when you build things, you know, you don't find people willing to pay. Of right? course. Yeah. But Indian consumer is quite silly. Yeah, Nobody wants to pay. Not even business, consumer, but businesses also. Yeah. So I think when we were building this uh, company, Samaj, we realized that, okay, we'll move on to this traffic. Right, but police can, doesn't have money; they cannot pay us. Yeah. So police cannot be our customer. Although it's a problem that we are solving for, 
which eventually police will benefit. Yeah. So we ended up working with toll booths because yeah. what happens Private, in India, yeah. people pay using fasttag. Yeah. So there is a sm fraud that they do. They take a, a fasttag which is issued for a small car. Mm -hmm. They take it in a bus or a truck. And the system thinks that it's a b car which is passing. Oh, okay. So they, so this is how uh, 25 crores is uh, uh, defrauded every day in India. Oh my God! So we solve this problem. So we generate a real-time video for the banks mm -hmm. because these tags are issued by banks, right. right? So if they get an evidence, then the toll company can recover the money because let's say if you were driving a truck but you are taking a Maruti Suzuki yeah. uh, issued fast tag, right? Mm -hmm. We can give the bank the evidence that this was a truck. Okay. But and do they get notified in real time or uh, like is it for conflict resolution? So we do this in real time. We okay. do this on the edge. Okay. And because we do this on the road and the traffic is moving on the roads. Yeah. So we end up indexing the traffic. So Got we are like the Google of traffic in India. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So now when the trap, let's say a vehicle was stolen, let's say in my case in 2017, it was ending up some in a city like Meerut and they would, you know, take all this the parts away, yeah. the car never comes back to the road, right? right. So, so our opportunity was only when if we are able to find the vehicle mm. on the road, mm. you know, when it is crossing. Yeah. So, there is this vein road, uh, which is called NH24 in Delhi, okay. right? Mm -hmm. So, on that road itself, we monitor a billion vehicles in a year. Wow. And wow. we are day and night, the quality of uh, you know, uh, vision is very different, right? right? And it's moving from 60 to 100 and the heterogeneity of data is mm -hmm. so now we do uh, there will be so many use cases like yeah so so now when the car is stolen police comes to us nice. because we can give them a real time access yeah. you know because even though car must be stolen anywhere but if it's taking some of these important roads so like 15 uh, august or 26 january they give us a database of stolen cars they want in a real time alert if this shows up so we are able to help the system a lot but the system cannot pay because they don't have money. Right. But we, we are, let's say, getting a business model where we are able to fund the company from private players. Yeah. But we are able to help uh, police solve crimes okay. as a side effect. Nice. What, what else? What, what, what other problems are you solving? So right now, my fascination is, you know, I think uh, we, this problem came to us because of Samaj only that, let's say, you have a lot of cameras. Mm. You have hours of footage or video. And you, you want to search a person like Angad in it, right? So police is not, never going to pay for this query if it takes, let's say, 100 hours of GPU time to find yeah, Angad, right? Yeah, yeah. It will translate, let's say, $100,000. Oh. Police will never be willing to pay, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So it we became convinced that we are already spending a lot of compute on the edge mm -hmm. when we are looking at the video, mm -hmm. but we are le leaving the video dumb, you know? So video was a bunch of, video is a bunch of image frames, yeah. image is pixels. Yeah. So we as humans represent in our brain, you know, information in a different way than humans uh, build these file formats in a very dumb way because we do correct. not understand them until we render them. Correct. correct. Right. Yeah, yeah. But now with AI, we have reached a limit mm. that machines can also understand, mm. uh, you know, vision. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm. But the problem is that uh, algorithms are writing this deduced information outside the files. Correct. What if we start storing this understanding back in the files? The, the file that we processed. How does that so, work? so basically, you know, uh, if you take a neural network and reduce it, uh, abstract it to, let's say, a function, right? Mm -hmm. So what this function is doing, it's taking an input and, you know, mapping it in the vector space, which okay. is a high dimensional space. Okay. And so, everything is represented as a vector. So I think this is the biggest opportunity for the humankind ever. That first time you encountered a function, where, which is in a latent space, yeah. it can represent knowledge in a universal format, yeah. which is a vector. Got so it. whether it's a sound, image, video, yeah. whatever, yeah. Yeah. right? And we can do vector multiplications to understand information, right? So for example, uh, I, I have an image or let's say 1000 photos in my phone and I want to ask, give me a photo of mine wearing green color, black turban, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it, it maps this piece of text also into a vector, wow. right? Mm -hmm. And this vector of text and this image that if it was there, they are very close in vector space, right? And we are able to map this text, one modality to other modality, and we are able to give you this image, wow. right? Mm -hmm. So if the file contains this vector already, mm -hmm. right? So 
for humans you know organizing knowledge and understanding knowledge will change we will make ai more sustainable mm -hmm. because ai right now is in limited hands of big companies they have the compute yeah. not average person has the compute no, okay. but the ai is moving to the edge right. right so if imagine a phone app you have mm -hmm. when you are clicking the photo mm -hmm. can it enhance the metadata of that photo yeah yeah that doesn't really matter downstream yeah. wherever you want to use the photo mm -hmm. your phone is able to understand that photo the way human understands it and today that is the missing point whether it's photos videos graphics there are bunch of pixels and polygons right, right? right so this is what we want to change yeah. we want to make a better internet because internet today comprises 90 95% of content that we do not understand i mean machines do not understand yeah. for us humans to understand we have to render it correct so we do not understand them stand alone hmm. right as a file format because there are bunch of pixels right? Right, right right so i think that gives us lot of opportunity you know imagine <clears throat> you have a uh, photos of your friend mohan hmm. right hmm. mohan doesn't know that you have his photos right. what if you started okay if i have your photos you know you can know Right. because he wants them right, right. of course the, you have to keep, take care of consent and yeah, privacy yeah, yeah. and all that yeah. but what i'm saying is that people can discover yeah. people can own the media mm. but having in uh, knowledge in embedding space mm. you know uh, mohan can search for photos not just in his photos mm -hmm. but maybe also able to search in a friend circle okay. or in the entire enterprise wow right yeah. so i think things can change in a fundamental way i definitely think so Yeah. <laughs> right, like, you know, just on the basis, of the, I, I think you're sitting on a gold mine. Yeah. Like if I can think of like at least like ten or twelve apps off the top of my head, which could be utilizing what you're trying to build. Yeah. So we what we want to achieve is here that we want to open source all of this, right? So we want to open source, sure. let's say, uh, the client side, the server side, mm -hmm. and also this function. Okay. So which uh, maps this media to embedding, mm -hmm. because if the world agrees on a Uh, uh, on a common function, mm -hmm. then then only you get interoperability. Because right now these embedding models exist. They exist from big companies, mm -hmm. but you if they deprecate that model, all your effort that you spent on compute gets wasted. Correct. So these embedding models also exist in open source. Mm -hmm. We just want to research on it, and we want to build let's say an optimum algorithm, mm -hmm. right? And we want to work on the algebra of the embedding space. so that if you have to do that operation mm -hmm. let's say you are a developer you you end up using our sdk right. you can achieve that operation whatever downstream use case that you may have mm -hmm. in a in the fastest or the most efficient way possible mm -hmm. and if we are able to change the world in this way then we believe that we only need to apply ai once yeah and Then ever can, again yeah. you know you can just access the results right do you contribute to open source much other than this is are there any other examples where you so i would say you know in the past companies i didn't have that much opportunity to contribute because we were working in the services right, right. sector right. so there it's not our ip but yes i like to freely share my ideas so i like to yeah. you know whenever possible write blogs or give talks mm -hmm. so i think ideas are dime a dozen you know right. so right. so i fully believe in the open source uh, philosophy yeah okay is there anything else on the horizon right now on the road map for you yeah i think right now this is the most uh, exciting thing for yeah, me yeah i can imagine yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. all right all right so how, how can people you you mentioned that you write a lot of blogs and how, how can people reach out to you if they want to get in touch with you yeah i think i'm present on linkedin and uh, you already mentioned my name so my handle that i use on social media is sach gaur s a c h G A U R, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe I'm not a very up to date uh, presence, mm -hmm. but uh, you know But I. But you do still log in from yeah, time to time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. Yeah, yeah, it's my pleasure. Also. Thanks a lot. We, I'll, I'll see you for another episode. Yeah. Like, uh, I'd, I'd like to see this being built out and us catching up again in a couple yeah. of years. Thanks, Thanks. Yeah.